having that knowledge in your mind of, of what should be happening on content creation will allow you to then take on a better position on a project that you might be working on where you can then help the content creators guide them through their process because they will probably, if they've never done it before, come to you and say, hey, so you're the projection mapping like person. What do, what do, we, what do, we gotta, what do you need from us? And if you don't know what to kind of give them and tell them, it can make your life very difficult. Now, we talked about 2D masking already. And the nice thing about 2D masking is that there's very little preparation needed in general. It really can be as simple as you have your texture, you know, whether it's a movie, an image, uh, something you're rendering inside a touch designer. As long as you have that texture, you can basically crop it and throw it on the 2D mask that you put on the object and your projection mapping. It's that easy. Now, 2D masking can also have a little bit more complex side to it where, you know, you may have seen um, After Effects tutorials or, or situations, um, but it's also common for people to go to an object they'd like to projection map, you know, take a couple of pictures from where the projector might be or where they want their kind of um, best position to be for the audience. And then they'll come and they'll bring that image into After Effects or C4D and then they'll use that as kind of uh, their perspective for where, you know, all, all the vines growing up the building or if they have a car and they want, you know, smoke and fire to come off of it. They kind of use that image as their reference point and then they'll probably give it to you and say, here, project this onto the car. So now that's still in the 2D side of things because what you're going to be doing when you get that, you know, rendered image you're probably going to cut it up a little bit and then just apply it to the different parts of the car, you know, as the projector is casting light on it or the building or whatever. <coughs> now, 3D mapping is a little bit different and a little bit more complicated because it involves UV unwrapping and having an accurate 3D model of what we're going to be uh, projecting on. So in this case, if a car company comes to you and says, hey, we've got this car show, can you project on our car? And hopefully they won't say for free. Um, if they say the word collaboration, also don't do the gig. But the first thing you can ask them is, do you have an accurate 3D model of the car? Now what that's gonna do is that's gonna set you up to really unlock as much creativity as possible and work in the 3D space, You know, work with all kinds of uh, accurate texturing, um, if you can get models for what you're going to be pr projecting on, you'll have a much more fun time. The content will probably be way more interesting. Now, UV unwrapping, I said, that's kind of like, a, that might be a, a new term for some people who aren't coming from a 3D background. Essentially, every 3D model has what's called a UV map. And that's basically where, you know, if, if you took a flat, 512 by 512 texture, it's almost like, you, it's like, um, what do they call it, plastic wrap. You know, you take it and you wrap it around the 3D model and things go in specific places on this 512 by 512 texture. So when we're talking about UV unwrapping, what we're talking about is taking that 3D model and all its complexity and taking the texture and basically flattening it. So that way then we can work with it in something like Photoshop, After Effects, Touch Designer, it becomes much easier. We have basically a map of where these textures will end up on the 3D model. Now, what we're going to do today is, you'll notice my lovely assistant, aka three light bulb boxes that I brought with me from uh, Thailand. And just like in real life, we're going to make a model of them in C4D very quickly. I'm going to show you the UV unmapping process. Um, but as you can see, it, it's kind of janky. It's just like in real life, it's not going to be perfect. My measurements aren't really, you know, the box kind of warped in my bag a little bit. <coughs> but what we're going to do is we're going to make a UV map of it, and we're going to mark it up. And then we're going to use that as a guide to create a little bit of content in Touch Designer and apply it to that. Now, when we get to this next segment, you know, after we've done our, you know, uh, general content creation and 3D modeling and UV unwrapping, we get kind of to the next stage of projection mapping that I 
kind of like to talk about, which is your asset playback, your generative stuffs, and you know, just managing 3D models because they might be complex, there might be a bunch, there might be iterations, maybe it's a laser scan and you know, every day they send you a bigger one for no reason. Um, now, as we said, on our 2D side of things, that process is quite simple. You know, it's, it's playing back movie files and images, uh, generating whatever kind of effects you want, and that's really where it ends. You're, in the 2D masking side of things, you're generally just make a texture and you're ready to go. On the 3D side of things, we're going to talk about, you know, importing a model into Touch Designer. Uh, I'm specifically, I, by, I'm by no means a 3D modeler, so my C4D skills are super janky. Super <coughs> janky. But we're going to do it anyways, because I think it's an important part of the process to know about at least. So on the 3D mapping side, like I said, we're going to make a model, we're going to import it, you know, we're going to do a quick texturing of this model with our UV map, and then similar to 2D masking, we're going to have some content that we're going to apply to this 3D model. Now, the final, final, final stage of that pipeline. So we had the first stage, which was our content creation and 3D modeling. Our second stage, which is kind of our asset playback, generative stuff, 3D model management. Now the final stage of this pipeline is outputting, camera calibration, and doing our masking of this model. Now, in 2D masking, using our Cantan, it's going to be quite simple. It's really run and gun. You can show up the, just like I did, get a random projector, point it randomly off angle to a bunch of objects, and we're going to map it. Now, if you need to use multiple projectors, you know, it's still not too complicated with 2D masking because you're essentially drawing where your image goes. So you can just choose, you know, cut this one off here, start this one here, butt them up a little bit against each other. You can almost always get away without too much complex blending if you're, if you're using 2D masking <coughs> with multiple projectors. On the 3D mapping side of things, uh, you need one cam snapper per real world projector that you have. And Cam Snapper has some blending capabilities in it. We're not going to go too in depth because I've already been talking for 20 minutes. Now, I think unless there's any particular questions on those three elements of the pipeline that I just mentioned, uh, we can dive in and, and start projection mapping. Any questions? Don't be shy. Can we have We'll also have time at the end for questions. Yeah. Feel free to ask questions any time, but if we get to the end and you have questions, by all means, ask away. Okay, great. So let's, let's do projection mapping in the real world. So like I said, I have these. Let me try and get here without tripping. So this is my model thing that I'm going to be projecting on, three light bulb boxes. I'm going to put them here. Like so. I have a projector. I'm basically just going to try and get as much light as I can on my model. That's always a good place to start. It, I always say mess around a while with your hardware first because essentially once you put it somewhere, you're going to want to leave it there. And it's really easy to, especially for us <coughs> software type of people, we're like, yeah, we, we do this, we're like, yeah, it's okay, and then we kind of go and we try and fix everything in software. But it's almost always easier to just like grab this and move it than it is to sit there for like hours trying to like, you know, finesse the edge of it in software. So don't be afraid to like move it around a bit, play with the focus, you know, they, they've got all kinds of buttons on these things. I'm by no means a projector expert, but... You know, I, I can read and push buttons too, with the best of them. Make sure your projector is also in focus. Focus. Not the wrong way. Not too far. That is the weirdest projector. Focus. <coughs> Okay, 
Okay. Is it auto? What are you doing? Okay, that's pretty good. We're going to buy that. I'm going to do exactly the opposite of what I just said. I'm just going to leave it. So we're going to get good front side here, front side here. We'll get a little bit of these inside, and then we'll get this side on the outside as well. Okay, so we've got our projectors essentially set up. Let's make a really quick piece of content that we can use that might be interesting. So let's start by opening up Touch Designer. That's what we're all here for. Now the first thing I'm going to do, so I'm just going to make a container. This is a new project, by the way, nothing magic here. <coughs> I want to go inside my container and I'm going to create a ramp top. I'm going to change the type from horizontal to radial. I'm going to change the period from 1 to 0 0.5. Now I'm going to make a constant chop. Connect that to a speed chop. And then set the value of the constant to 1. That way we just have this continuous counting little ramp. I'm going to put a null chop afterwards, just because that is good practice. I almost, I'll tell you, confession, dark sin, I almost just exported the speed out of laziness, but I stopped myself. So put your null chop, and what we're going to do is click on the ramp top, activate the viewer on the null chop, and we'll drag and drop that channel into the phase parameter of our ramp. For this, I'm just going to use the export, but feel free to use a Python reference, T-Script, whatever you're most comfortable with, doesn't really matter. Now I'm going to make a rectangle top. I'm going to set the size to 1 and one. The fill alpha I'm going to set to zero. I'm going to change the border color to be white, so one, one, and one. And then I'm going to turn up the border width just so that I have this white outline of a box. Now, I'm going to make a composite top. And here's where the magic happens. I'm going to select both of these, plug them into the composite, and we've got projection mapping content. Step one, complete. <coughs> I'll put a null after this as well. <coughs> not an Oculus Rift top, not that one, nope. Null. Um, can you go back for a, yes. for a minute to the, when you set the constant of the speed that because of Yeah, make sure you set the constant value to one. Yes. Otherwise your speed will just always be zero. Yeah. But the speed that doesn't change it remains fixed. Is your timeline paused at the bottom? Uh, yeah. No. 
Listen, listen, I, 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 the reason I said that was because yesterday I spent half an hour <laughs> prepping for this with the timeline paused, and uh, I think it was Cantan Mapper gets really weird if the timeline is paused. So I was like, why isn't this working? What's going on? And then I looked at the timelines, but it, it happens to everybody. So just, you know, I don't know if anyone reads my blog, but the first thing you do when you're troubleshooting is just look for the really, like, jiggle the cable, make sure it's plugged, like, check the timeline, just get the easy stuff out of the way and hope that it's one of those things. To the phase. Ah, to the phase. Yeah. Okay. And I set the period to 0 0.5. Now I'm going to go up a level. I'm going to do what great people before me taught me to do, and I'm going to change the name of the container so that it says content. And then I'm going to make a new container before I go in I'm going to call it Cantan I'm going to go inside and now the fun is going to begin my friends I'm going to go to the dialog menu at the top and open my palette browser now, I like the hotkey Alt plus L. Very easy. Gives you a little floating one. Inside of the Tools section, which uh, by default is, is where mine opens up, we're going to scroll down and find Cantan Mapper. Now, it's important that... So, I mean, I, um, I consider myself a benevolent dictator, but... Because we're using tools that are quite complex and sometimes don't get updated as, as often as you know, we would wish, follow along even if I do something where you're like, oh, I don't want to make a container. So a good example is a Cantan, if you put it on the root level of your project, doesn't work properly. So you know, if I'm making containers and like naming them, just bear, follow me and, and trust, trust me. Trust me, we're going to get there. So inside of this Cantan container, Inside of the tools palette? And, yeah, connect recorder is the only one. The only thing you have in there is connect recorder? Yeah, with K. Something with K. Here, uh, this might be a palette issue. You want to just throw it on there? TO exit? Yep. Uh, how did touch open here? Yeah, I'll, I'll just copy it Don't worry, I got your back. For everyone else, drag it in. I, ha I have to do that. I have to hit the eject button. I can't just pull them. <laughs> My psyche, I won't sleep at night if I just pull them. Okay, so now we have Cantan Mapper. Very helpful tool. First thing you're going to notice is there's a bit of a UI here. And in your custom parameters, under the Cantan page, you have two useful buttons, open and close. So let's hit open and we'll get this window that comes up. So here's where our paths will diverge a little bit. I have a projector, <coughs> and none of you have a projector. So what I suggest you guys do for the meantime is set the resolution here to something small, like 640 by 480. Because what we'll do is for you guys, we'll have it pop up in the lower part of your screen just so that you can kind of see and play around yourself as well. Now you can go to your window options button here and it's going to be a very familiar window comp. I usually leave most of these things the same. The only thing I suggest you do is turn on always on top. That way when it's on your screen and you're working, 
it will just stay in that little bottom corner so you can see the output. Now for my case, I'm going to set this to monitor 1. You guys should leave it at 0. And I'm going to change my resolution to the resolution of the projector, <coughs> which let me find what that is. Nineteen ten eighty, okay. Nineteen twenty by ten by one eighty, that's the one. Now if you hit toggle output, you'll see on my projector, uh, I've lost my you know my Windows menu bar. That means it's open for me. If you guys were following along on the other part, you should have a little six forty by four eighty window open in the bottom left. Now, I'm not going to go over every feature of Cantan, uh, just kind of what we need to really get down and dirty and start working. So stuff like BG mask, I'm not going to worry about. What you'll notice is this section is very important here, and this is kind of um, very much our similar to Photoshop layers. So all of our different rectangles and freeforms that we're going to draw, they're going to make a separate layer in this area. You can also group them together if you like, if you're a nice, organized, civilized human being. If not, you can have rectangle 1 through 50. You know, your choice. I don't judge. Um, what is important to note <coughs> is that the compositing of those elements happens from top to bottom. So the topmost element in your shapes layer is actually the bottommost element in your kind of composite. So if you had two rectangles on top of each other, the one higher up in the list is actually going to be under the one lower down in the list. Now you'll see in the tools section, a couple of nifty little buttons. We've got two different kinds of selectors. We'll talk about the differences. And then two different types of uh, kind of create objects. One is for just making quads, rectangular type uh, four corner objects. And the other is a freeform tool, which is very nice. We'll talk about a little bit more of that. So what you can see here is that's kind of our control area. Then we have this pink rectangle. And you can see as I move through this pink, re pink rectangle, on my output, I have a very nice orange crosshair. Now it's also important to note that I can actually take my mouse over to the projector and it is the exact same thing. So if I'm, we'll see very soon, once I start you know, making a couple shapes and I'm working on my panel here, I could also just move my mouse over and work on my actual output. So you know, if you're in one of those situations where you're like in the middle of the club and you're like that guy holding the laptop like, like this and you're trying to, you know, you can just put it down and you know, get your wireless mouse and keyboard and go sit there on a table and you know, generally work from there, unless you need this kind of side panel. Everything else can, can be done in here and on that projector output. So let's get started right away. And let's, the first thing we're going to do is the simplest thing. We're going to create a quad. So that's this third button in the tool section. You'll see your output changes color, becomes bright blue. And just like I said, what I, well, before I do the just like I said part, let's just make a quad. So I can click and drag, and you'll see I'm making a rectangle, and once I let go, magic. Pure magic. I have a quad. Now I'll do the just like I said earlier. So if I make another quad, in this example that I made here, I actually clicked and dragged in my panel. But I can actually just go over to my projector output, and just click and drag here and get the exact same result and when I let go I'll have a, a quad very similar. So that, that's what I was talking about where you can work on both sides as long as you don't need this toolbar your projector output is just as valid. So I'm going to delete that second quad and I can do that either by selecting it in the kind of edit space and you can see if you just select different ones you get a little outline with some points I could select it, hit delete, or I could come to this layers area, 
click on it and hit delete. Now I'm without a quad again, so let me make a quad. Now once you have a quad, a free form, even a group, <coughs> what you'll see is when you click on them, below the tool section, you'll essentially have all the parameters of that layer. Now, it's important to note that uh, the group, you'll see even a group that doesn't have, you know, the group doesn't actually have a thing. It's just, you know, the grouping of a bunch of other things. It has a few options here just to do a simple transform, rotate scale. <laughs> this is really useful if you're doing one of those mapping jobs where there's like a million tiny objects and you're drawing these little like, Beep, 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 and then someone kicks the projector and you're like I, I hate you so much and then you, you put the projector back and everything is slightly shifted to the left so before in old Cantan you would have had to move everything one by one now in new Cantan we've got the that's why groups are amazing because then if all of those things are grouped you just take the whole group and say okay well the group's going group go right a little bit rotate a little bit and you should be moderately back in business pretty quickly. Uh, for today's thing, we're not going to use groups too much because that is not one of those things with a million little things. It's three cardboard boxes. So if you click on the rectangle that we just made, you'll see it has uh, a ton more different properties, uh, things like colors, textures. What we're going to do right now, quick and dirty, is actually let's map this onto one part of the box. So I'm going to, either I can grab them in here and you can see because I have my little cursor I can just click and oh make sure you're on this second tool by the way the select keys and handles that'll give you the corner point which you can select and drag <coughs> easily and you can see I can just kinda throw it in the corner over here bring my next point over put that in the corner over here Let's bring this next point. We're projection mapping people. It's happening. Where's that gif with the dude going like this? And the I need that going on right now. Look at that. Do you feel powerful or what? <laughs> now let's quick. Any questions so far? Is everyone everyone's doing good? What do you got? Is there an undo function? I don't know. Let's find out. Yes, there is. Just click inside and hit Control-Z. Now, do you feel powerful? <laughs> I don't know if it, let me see if there's an undo, or redo. There is also a redo. Great, so what I'm going to quickly do. The old Cantan did not. The old Cantan was a rogue, a rogue human application. That's uh, Oh, that's one of those things. Let me, I'm just going to be, there is no touch designer on this computer. Do not get me wrong, people. <laughs> touch designer is on this computer. <laughs> yes, sir. Is there an option to um, click and move the object around, or do we have to use the translate options? There is. So, now we've been using this uh, one mouse style here that gives us the four corner handles. The left one is kind of more of a whole object, so if you click on it, you'll see I have things that, I'm going to make a new rectangle because I don't want to mess up that one. I'm going to make a new quad real quick. The leftmost one lets you click and drag the whole object. You get kind of more global parameters like, you know, you can grab the corner and rotate it. You can grab these inner pink handles, do some quick scaling. I'm more the kind of guy who I just find it easier to just go there and be like, this corner here, this corner here, this corner here, this corner here. That, when I can be a simple person, I like to be a simple person. So now we have that one side mapped. Let's really quickly map the other two front sides of that. I'm going to make another quad. <coughs> you know, I'll just drag it roughly where it is. I'll make sure I'm on this second tool here. And this time I'm actually just going to move my mouse over, which is actually harder in this case because the points are hard to see. But, you know, you can see I can click and just grab the point even on the projector oh, that's not where the point and just drag it into place Oop. 
Great, now we've got two quads. We're doing good so far. Now, what if you have a weird surface that isn't a quad? We'll get to that in a bit, but I'll start by showing you the freeform tool, which I also find very useful for quads in a lot of settings, because what you can do is the freeform tool is the last little box we have here. We can click on it. Now, this is, this is where the magic happens. I can actually just come over onto my projector, go to the first corner, click. It's going to put a point there. I can go down, find the next corner, click. It's going to put a point there. Go over to the third one, put a point. Go back to the last corner, put a point. And then I'll just close it by going back to the first one. And now I have a quad. And I didn't have to do all that extra little rummaging around to move it around. Uh, what you'll notice is that I've got two green ones and a purple one. Uh, you see this color option here. You can by all means change the color to, to whatever helps you with your calibration. I usually like really bright blue or white just to splash as much you know, water on the scene as I can. But let's put some textures on this. So what we'll start with really quickly is we'll just put a movie file in top, you know, somewhere beside Cantan. I'm going to change the movie to be uh, one of these nature scenes that are inside of that nature folder when you open up uh, the folder selector. You can, by all, if you got video clips, by all means use whatever you want. Now adding a texture to a mask, extremely simple. All we have to do is select the mask. So let's start with this green one here, the top little part. And I take the movie file in and I can just click and drag it and you'll see there's a texture parameter right there and I can just release it and you'll see a little reference line now we don't see anything yet because this little X this is kind of like a, a toggle to enable and disable so if you see this little X beside a, a parameter if it's the X it's disabled and if you click it it becomes enabled so now that's not like a super bright texture by any means but you can see what it's doing. It's taking my texture, filling that box, the quad that we have, and it's coming out on the uh, projector. So I could easily make another one. Let's make another movie file in. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with banana on this one. So I'll click again on the quad that I want to change the texture of, grab my movie file in, and drop it on the texture parameter, and then I'll make sure to check that box. Is everyone hanging in there so far? I know it's early. You know, how many people went to Berghain last night? Don't, be honest, <laughs> be honest. Now, when it comes to the rectangle quad, you know, rectangle slash quad and the free form, I'm not going to go too in depth on a lot of the other parameters that we have, so just so that we can get, you know, through most of the basics. But you'll see that you have uh, important ones are transforms, little rotate arrow keys and uh, translate arrow keys. Just in case you need to nudge it a little bit, you can kind of grab it and, and just nudge the whole thing, you know, one pixel to the right, one pixel to the left split the difference just right. Uh, what is, uh, you know, and you've got shape tools down here, rows and columns, and you know, you can grid warp and do all this other stuff to it. We're not going to get into that. Uh, <coughs> those are easy enough to kind of experiment with on your own if you understand the rest of the process. What is very helpful though is this edit texture button. Uh, what it allows you to do is it gives you the texture and you can crop out a portion of it, scale it, stretch it, rotate it. Uh, you can do what you need to make that texture fit properly onto that surface that you have. So right now it looks like our banana is getting a little, uh, a little bit squashed in there. So let's see what we can do here. We'll grab this corner point, 
And you can see as I'm doing this, it's, it's actually changing in real time over there. I'm dragging the corner and it's changing my texture. So if I know my object is kind of more like the, the surface I'm mapping on is a bit more of a rectangle like so, you know, I could kind of rough this in myself. So now that banana kind of looks a little bit more banana-y. Alternatively, what I can do is I can, I can reset the texture bounds and then all that translation and hit this set as mask button, which will actually give me a mask to use that is the correct shape of you know, the quad that I've created. Now I could take this and do something like use the scale and say, okay, make it you know, three scale by three scale. Oops. And then use these translate parameters Go, 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 go. And if you hold shift and click on them, it moves faster. We're getting there. Go in, go in. Maybe I'll turn the scale up to four by four. I mean, I also, I don't know why I'm doing this. I could just <laughs> click on this, this selector. It's early, people. Don't, don't judge me. I click on this selector and I can just click and drag and move it. I don't know what I'm doing here. And then you can see I can kind of select out, you know, that part of the banana that I like. Let's say we want some of, yeah, no, let's go for this, this part here. And I know that I have that texture on the object not being warped and squashed in weird ways. <coughs> yes, sir. So it's set, it's set this mask is just simply like moving it, dragging, like putting it around the object to kind of like Essentially what set as mask will do is it'll give you the, sh the shape and size of your actual output that you have. So if you look here, yeah, the quad we have is kind of this, this skewed one. And when I hit set as mask, it basically recreates my quad in this kind of texture editing environment. So that way I know when I'm trying to crop out a piece of my content, I'm cropping it out to the right shape so that it's not getting stretched or um, you know, cropped in any extra way that I don't want. So that way the aspect ratio and all that stays correct. Does that make sense? Do we have any other questions so far? Is there any way to select multiple points? Is there any way to select multiple points? I don't believe there is a way to select multiple points. Maybe you shift to place it possibly on the... Let us find out. Shift click does not give us multiple points. Control click does give us multiple points though. And they do move together. That's pretty uh, nifty. What about duplicating a quad? Uh, what about duplicating a quad? That is a good question. I don't know about duplicating a quad. But at that point, doing the free form or dropping you know, four new points is pretty quick. How do you add additional group? Oh, uh, right next to the shape title, there's a little folder. And if you add it, you'll get a group. And it's really easy to just drag and drop you know, the elements in the layers into the group. You can't select more, more uh, rectangles at once. So if you have those 50 rectangles. And you want to move them all into a group? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't believe so. It doesn't seem like shift or control allow you to do that. That's going to be 50 click and drags, unfortunately. Cool. You can also re, I mean, I've been, been bad about, I, I have two rectangles in a free form, but you know, on groups or shapes, you can find this name parameter, you know, change it to be something meaningful, even though I'm not naming them correctly. Everyone following so far? So in 45 minutes, you learned how to projection map. You can like basically like walk into any club now, walk into any venue, and you're ready to kind of run and gun, connect up to the projector, you know, draw a couple masks on the things you want to project, put some textures on them. I'm going to show you one more trick that I find very helpful with Canton Mapper before we shift over and start talking about 3D. <coughs> 
mapping and, and that work. So in this method that we've been doing, we've been drawing masks for what we want to have light. I've, oh yeah. I'm sorry. If they need uh, more points, for example, if they have uh, a point between, I have a, uh, like, like this. Uh, <coughs> for that, we'll use the free form. So hold that question because we're going to do free forms okay. now a bit more with this. Now, like I was saying, so in this example, we've been creating masks for where we want images to be. What I found very helpful is actually creating masks for where you don't want light to go instead. And it, it sounds like a very simple, like, what? what are you talking about? But let's delete all these. And I'm just going to delete this extra group. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a free form for myself. I'm going to come over to my projector. And what I'm going to do is actually, I'm just going to make a big rectangle around the whole area that I'm projecting. You know, I don't really care if I'm blowing over or going under. I just want to get everything in there. Now I'm going to change this color just to be white just so that it's easier to see what we're doing. Now I'm going to click on this free form and let me give it a texture. I'm going to use possibly my favorite clip of all time. <coughs> Count.mov. So I'm going to drag that movie onto the texture. I'll turn it on just so we can see it really quick, so we know we're, we're okay here. But I'm going to actually turn it off and, and set it back to white, just a little easier to work with. Now what we're going to do with this is one of those situations where you have a bunch of stuff and you want the same texture to kind of just cross over everything and then you just don't want it to bleed out in the no image space, we'll call it, the no fly zone in the middle. So it, you could do that by using the first method where you make a little mask for every position, putting the texture in, uh, fixing your little edit texture for every single one. In most cases, I find that to be a little too time consuming, which is what led me to kind of just you know make this secondary way in which I actually make a surface that covers the whole place I want to project. And then what I do is I just draw black masks over the parts that I don't want covered, you know, don't want covered by projection. And then, I, then my image will stretch over the whole thing a lot easier. So in this example, <laughs> we've got, uh, you know, the front. Actually, what I'll do is I'll make this bigger so it, like, goes onto the walls and stuff and really makes a mess. Perfect. So that's, that's going to be our texture. That's going to be playing our count.mov. But you can see we're blown over onto the walls. We don't want that. We just kind of want count.mov on those three front parts of our model. So what I'll do now is, just like we said, so the first layer is going to be the bottom layer. And anything we put on top of that is just going to cover that layer. So what I can do now is I can do something like make a grid, or a quad, I should say. You know, draw a quad in here just so I have it. You know, I'll set its color to black. And I want to make sure, like I said, that it's actually below my freeform. Oh, I set it to white, not black. And what you see is over there, my black is covering the texture behind it. So I can grab these points, and just like we were before, now I can contour the outside of the object instead of the inside to basically say, okay, well, I don't want any projector shining th through the middle of here. You can see I'm kind of getting that inside of the archway blocked. I can do the same thing. I can do a free form. Now, with the last time we made a free form, we just put four points. But free form is not limited in any way. So for the free form, I could say, okay, well, uh, let's just start like right here. You know, then come over here a little bit to the right. 
And then let's just go up here to this top corner. I mean, you can put as many, as long as you keep clicking, you're just going to keep making points. It, it, won't, it won't stop. I can go to this corner, make a point. You know, let's say come, uh, actually from that side, let, I'll say I'll go outwards. And then kind of just make a little wrap around this whole area here. And I'm just kind of like making a little mask that basically covers all the stuff I don't want to have projected on. And then I can just make that color mask black. And what you'll see when I turn on, uh, where is count.ml? <coughs> You know, we don't have to finish that to get the, the example, but what you can see is now I have that texture kind of covering that object that I want. I didn't have to go through all the extra tedious work of <coughs> editing textures for every single one. I can just do it for, you know, now that I have this selected, I can say edit texture, do the similar set mask. You know, I can kind of just do this <coughs> texture editing one time. I'd be lying if I said I knew why that happened, but if you have a, uh, what is it, um, what's the word? If you're prone to seizures, please look away. But you know, I can, I can fix this texture kind of where I want it to be on the model, and then know that everything else outside of the model is going to be blacked out and not projected on. Does that make sense? It's kind of the same workflow, but from the other you know, coming at it from a different angle. <coughs> now, as the gentleman over here asked, what if you need to add another point? Uh, when you're working with freeforms, you'll see under the little mouse commands, you have two other commands. One of them is to convert between Bezier point and just a, you know, a flat point. Uh, the other one is to insert key. So you can click on this one. You can just come to any part of your point, click and get a new point in there. What we're not really going to go into is you can also draw Bezier, so if you click and drag. Oh. Actually, i got to switch out of this. i got to go back to this. How do they draw the Beziers? I mean, you can do all kinds of funny stuff. 90% of the time, you're probably not going to need that. Is there, is there a shortcut uh, to talk between these, these two um, grabbers? I don't know of one, and I don't believe there is. I could be wrong, though. Could be faster to work. Now, is everyone up to speed <laughs> so far? The, the mask, uh, the black is, is it's not, uh, it's not covering that. So make sure that on your layer order, yeah. what you have is that the topmost layer is your movie, and then below it are your masks, and then just make sure to set them to 0, 0, 0, 1 as the color, which is black right. with an alpha of 1. Feeling good? Hanging in there? 10 a.m.? When I do, uh, sir. Yes, sir. So if try having your mouse inside of the screen and, and hitting undo, because the mouse does, does it undo? No, I'm getting. Even with your mouse inside, of, like make sure you select, like click inside the window and then try, and it still doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I have I. God bless your soul, my friend. I, I, I uh, make sure you're on the latest build, <laughs> and uh, you know use the form to submit a bug report. The reason this is this is built all with Touch Designer and 
we sort of just missed that. Maybe it was probably designed on a Windows machine. And so the shortcut was made. Uh, oh, so you have to actually press Control Z. Oh, control Z. <laughs> so uh, that's, it's a nice note, and uh, we'll make a note of that. Try to fix that. Or you could just use a proper machine. <laughs> <laughs> proper machine for the job. Hey, I mean, I have this. I'm not going to like, oh, don't use Mac. I love this thing. But not for this work. I mean, there's tools for the job, right? Okay, so if we're feeling confident with this, we have actually covered a lot of the basics of 2D projection mapping. You know, you can get more advanced, you can experiment, draw beziers, play with the different rows and columns, you can do grid warps, whatever you want. But from here, you should have a very basic understanding of, you know, get some textures, open up Cantan, and, and get working with it. So from here, what we're going to do is, you know, and I could have actually, I didn't do it, but, you know, I could have grabbed the fancy little texture I made here, you know, select it, put it on the thing, and make it do the... Frivolous, frivolous. So let's make another container, go up to the top level. And we're going to call this uh, Cam S, because Cam Schnapper is like the hardest thing for me to spell, and I will never spell it correctly. Now, before we get too into the touch design thing, let's just go inside of this network. Save your project somewhere. Never work with 3D models before saving your project. I can't tell you how important that is because if you don't, your 3D models are going to end up on the desktop and then after you save your project, your 3D models don't go with it. So then the next time you open the project, it's, you're gonna, the project will be missing all the 3D models. It's not going to know where they are. So always save first before you get working with 3D models. So I haven't saved this, so let me just save this on my... I'll make a new folder on my desktop, call it workshop. Workshop.to. So now if I drag in a 3D model, it's going to put it properly inside of that project folder. It'll be referenced correctly. We're safe. Uh, let me close my Canton window because I forgot to do that. Okay, so 2D masking is way to put Canton out of your mind. We're going to talk about the 3D side of mapping, uh, the process behind it, and a little bit about Cam Snapper. So, like I said, we need to have a 3D model. So let's 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 do this. Let's do this for real. So I'm going to open Cinema 4D. And like I said earlier, don't judge my C4D skills. I watched like two tutorials five years ago. Watch the tutorials again last week to remember this. <laughs> but we can do this. This is easy. I can model this. Uh, I took the measurements. I just I memorized them. So what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm going to make the cube. It's I'm going to say 130 by 43. That's each one of those light bulb boxes. I mean, this stuff you don't have to follow around. I'm just just. Kind of absorb it so that you feel the process and you know that if you're telling someone else to do this, you know what you're asking of them. So in this case, I'm, I'm making these 3D models myself. Like I said earlier, you know, with a lot of the new uh, technology we have, uh, laser scanning is becoming more and more cost effective, uh, as well as uh, the photogrammetry, which I've seen uh, people make really intricate point clouds of whole city blocks just by and then they have this like crazy text file that's like 50 megabytes. I'm like, what do you want me, what do you want me to do with this? Uh, in this case, I just have three squares so we don't need photogrammetry or any of that. I'm just going to kind of put these kind of where they got to go. Oops. Why is that not rotated? 90. Okay, sweet. We've got a finished 3D model. Amazing. It's like the Mona Lisa, but better. Now let me convert these all. 
combine them. Uh, don't mind that. That's not. <laughs> that's not important. Don't judge me. That's not important. <laughs> Now, I have these all as one object now. Uh, this is kind of a little bit more of the interesting stuff. I'm going to make a material, you know, in this, whatever software you're on, you can drag it on. Uh, C4D has a very nice body paint UV editing features that are pretty easy to use, even for someone as bad at this as myself. Those aren't the important part. I'm just going to kind of go through a bit of the steps to make the map and the texture and stuff like that. But what every software will have is this. And what you've seen is, now that I've made the texture, I've told C4D, make a UV uh, wrap of this. And I have this over here. This is the magic. That's the money. That's, that's the good stuff. That is every side of my object flattened out and put onto this square texture. Now, if I had something more complex, like a sphere, you'd see some really cool, like, and it would be this weird-looking thing. But it would basically be, a, you know, like when you were a kid and you took paper and you folded it to make stuff, like origami, but you were a kid, so you can't do origami. This was like, you know, origami for 10-year-olds. Same, same principle. This is the unwrapping of that element. So now that I've come to C4D, I've, I've modeled my object. You know, I've made this UV map right here. Uh, I would go through and I'd, uh, let me make a new, a lot of the softwares will also have different ways that you can present that unwrapping onto the 2D surface. So this way, the default way that uh, C4D does, it maximizes to fill as much space as possible. You can also do things like, this is the box projection, which keeps all the connecting sides as best as it can, so that way, you know, if someone was making some animation that kind of flowed between these sides, something like this might be easier. I would recommend if you're getting the 3D modelers or you're doing it yourself to do these things, just make sure your texture is very large because otherwise, you can see in this example, it's not using a lot of this. T and I mean, that's a 1024 by 1024 texture by default. So this would only be, you know, maybe this is like less than 100 pixels. There's not a lot of resolution. So if you're going to go kind of these ways that are less optimized than the, this default way, just make sure you account for the fact that you want to increase the texture resolution just to make sure that you have some uh, fidelity to work with. For me, this is more than fine. Uh, most of these kind of UV editing stuff will have layers in them, so I'm going to get rid of that gray background. I don't need it. Like I said, I'm going to create my... UV mesh layer, which will basically outline all of those different parts onto the texture for me. Now here's the cool, I don't know, I, like I just, because I don't 3D model, I find this so interesting. I'm going to make a new layer. Select this paint, I can like just paint on this, isn't that like crazy? Am I the only one impressed that I can do this? So what I'm going to do is, label it. This is important. Like if you're working with a 3D model and they just give you a, like an unwrapped UV, that's the most useless thing that you're ever going to get because you're not going to know like what, as you can see, like when I draw on this, it's like nonsensical and turn sideways and all that kind of stuff. So when I'm getting people to mark these up, what I'll usually do is I'll have them number everything and then also orient it. So in this case, it's simple. I can, you know, the thing's not complex. I can just put a dot in the top right corner. That way when I look at, you know, one of these numbers, on the 2D version, I can see, okay, well, there's the one, and that's the top right corner, you know, on this side. I know I kind of have a sense of the orientation. So I can go through this, and I'll just do this really quick. I'll just kind of label the, oh, that's, that was supposed to be a three. <laughs> three. <coughs> kind of put a dot there. Go over here, four, five. Put a six. So when you ask someone to label something that's like really complicated, just think about the time that that's supposed to be an eight too. Think about the time that I sat here like struggling through this. I mean, they're going to be better at it than me, obviously, but. Nine, I'll put a couple X's on stuff we don't want. We don't want this stuff. 
Oh god. The struggle is real. Don't want that. Okay, cool. So we've got this basic oh, don't want that one either. Damn, wow. Okay. So we've got this basically mapped out. Now this is kind of where you would want your 3D modelers to get to. You'd want them to have an accurate model. You'd want them to label the UV map that they give you, the unwrapped version that we have over here, ideally in different layers. Otherwise, you just have like just one garbled nonsense. So this is where you want them to get to. This is kind of like the, the ground zero of it. Now, in this case, I'm going to export this as an FBX. I usually prefer to use FBX exports. They, they seem to just be the easiest one to move around. Textures come in, everything comes in. They, I, sometimes I find if I'm using OBJs, like a thing will come in as a million pieces, which is just useless. Uh, so I'll you know, export this. I'll put this on my desktop. Really, you don't need any of the things except textures, materials, unless, you have, unless the 3D guys are doing something crazy and they have cameras of their own. You might want to import those, but I don't need any of those. And then what you'll also want to do is get them to save the UV map separately for you as a Photoshop file. Now what this allows you to do is essentially, hopefully, the people doing the 3D stuff send the content people this, these two files. That's, that's what they need. They're going to send that to you. They're going to send that to the content people. You have the UV map in Photoshop as separate layers. So this is the... Uh, oh, it's because I'm on the internet. <sighs> Duh, I guess I could log in. Whatever, sure. Everyone else can get booted. Give me a moment. I do one of those things where all the passwords are gibberish, so I have no idea what the password is. <clears throat> I've cracked the code, people. I've done it. Pandora's box is opening for me. Just ignore everything else you see here. Great, so you got, this is what you want to come away with from the 3D modelers. Let me put a just quick background here so it's a bit easier to see. Now this is gonna be crucial because the modelers may just be modeling, they may be laser scanning, they may be doing that thing. You may have people in After Effects, you know, separately making content and what they're gonna need is they're gonna need this. Because what you do is you give them this, they know where all the pieces of the puzzle go, they uh, can sorry. go in. Can you show one more time how, you, how you have you saved the textures in for the... Uh, yeah, you just, uh, once you have your texture made, it's just file. If you're in the body paint mode, save texture as. Okay. And then you just select Photoshop. <laughs> it's going to be different in whatever you use it, and you, I wouldn't recommend taking my tutorial on C4D. Yes, sir. You could, but I found the FBX to be more reliable in getting everything across cleanly. Um, sometimes at the OBJ, I've had issues where things come in actually in a lot of different pieces more than I would like, even if they were already kind of grouped together a little bit more cleanly on the 3D modeling side. Both can work, though, and I think 099 has a better support for OBJ as well. So try and, and just see. I, I, always, I usually start with FBX. If I find it strange, I try OBJ. You know, be flexible. So I'm not going to get too deep into this, but this is really important because this is what you then want to give to the content creators because this is what's important to them, a UV map that they can just bring into After Effects, Premiere, whatever, they're, Nuke, whatever they're working in. They can take this. They can read it. It's 2D. It's safe for them. That's good. We don't really need much more of it. And then the 3D one, that'll be helpful for if C4D folks are making content, if 
you got 3D people kind of doing crazy stuff, and for us when we're going to do our mapping. So now that we've got our geometry ready and our texture ready, we'll start by importing them into Touch Designer. So I'll grab my FBX, drag and drop it in. Now normally these FBX files come as nested geometry comps. For our setup, it's quite simple, so we're going to go inside of the geometry, and I'm just going to go down into the network until I find the actual geometry SOP. I'll go up one level, grab the parent container, and then I'll delete the unnecessary geometry comp. So that way, when I imported my geometry, I basically just cleaned it up, and I'm left with one geometry comp, which inside of it directly is the mesh and the map, which will connect momentarily. The one thing we want to do as well is zero out any of the transform and rotation uh, parameters that are on the geometry comp because Camp Snapper itself doesn't actually look at any of them, so they'll just get in the way when we're working with our render setup. Now in terms of our diffuse map, what we can do is point those at our desktop at our matte color. And then if we go up a level, we can see that we have the texture we drew in Photoshop applied correctly back onto our geometry. And that's kind of the key that we're talking about with projection mapping. You take your geometry, you unwrap the UV, you give that to the content creators in After Effects, they can kind of make their map on the flat surface or do effects, and then they'll give it back and it wraps perfectly back around on your geometry. Now to get started with Camp Schnapper, we're going to open the Dialogues palette browser, and Cam Schnapper is under the Tools section. We'll find it here, we'll drag and drop it in. And what you'll notice is that Cam Schnapper is actually a camera component. And that's very useful, like as we said earlier, you know, in the same sense that microphones and headphones kind of share similar properties. For our purposes, cameras and projectors share very similar properties. Now because this is a camera component, we're actually gonna need to create a render setup. So I'll start by making a render top. The render top wants to know where the camera is, so I'll drag Cam Snapper onto that parameter. Cam Snapper would also like to know where the render top is, so similarly I can drag and drop the render top onto that parameter. Now, normally when we're working in Touch Designer, we're always pointing our renders to geometry comps but Camp Snapper would actually like to find the SOP of the geometry. So we know it's inside of this geometry comp called cube underscore three. And let's find what the name is. It's named mesh with an underscore M. So we'll say cube three mesh. And now you see we have this nice little triangle of references and we can get started working with Camp Snapper. So the first thing you like to do is set your output correctly. And I, my projector is output one. I'll open that output. The next thing I'm going to do is open the Cam Snapper window. And unlike Cantan Mapper that we were doing before, the two windows have very different functions. It's not like Cantan where they kind of do the same thing and you can work in either. The edit window that we have on our main display, our kind of working display, is more of a viewer where we can select points. And then the output that's coming out of the projector is where we will go to drag those points that we selected onto the real world geometry. So what you can do in this window is hold control and you can begin by kind of reorienting your geometry using left click, middle click, and right click while holding control. Now it's important to note that the viewer here doesn't actually influence the algorithms behind Camp Snapper. It's just for your ease of use. So in this case, I usually like to make my viewer match the perspective that the projector might have, just so that that way it's a little easier for me to select points on the model and then correspond them to the points that the projector sees. So I'll drag this around a little bit more. I think that's pretty close to what my projector is looking at. Now the one other thing we can do as well is select the color map, but we'll do that later because, actually you know what, we'll do it now. Let's go and we know it's inside of cube three, cube underscore three, 
and it is called diffuse map. Diffuse map. And we're doing this now just to make sure that we're looking at the correct side of our geometry. I can't tell you the countless amount of times where you know, I've oriented the geometry, set it all up, done the warping, and, and then realized, you know, crap, I'm, I'm looking at the back of the geometry. So if you have your texture, you might as well just connect it right now. That way we can orient this correctly. Now I find it's easier to work when there's no color map on there, so I'll just delete this for now just so we have a pure white output on our projector. Now we're free to get started and, and begin mapping. So the first thing I'm going to do is, as you can see, I can highlight the points. I'll pick one in the top left corner. And when I click on it, it becomes yellow and gives me a little tag. What you'll also see is on your projector output, you'll have a yellow crosshair that has that same label for point zero. Now if you move your mouse over to the projector, your mouse has a red crosshair. So I find it easy to line up by lining up your red crosshair with the yellow crosshair and then you can click and drag and bring that point to where it needs to go. So I'll move this and put this on the top left of my geometry. Now it's important to know that Cam Schnapper is a port of Kyle McDonald's Mapamock, which is an open frameworks project. And there's quite a bit of documentation that you can read about the best practices. Uh, the two that we're gonna follow in our simple geometry is that the, hot, the sweet spot is around 6 to 10, 6 to 12 points. You don't want to have too many points because it's, it's just going to create a lot of broken geometry and you don't really get any output if you have less than you know 5 or 6. The other thing that you want to do is try and spread your points out onto the different planes of your geometry so that you get a good coverage between you know the height and the depth of the geometry. You know if you put them all on the front face it may work, it may not work, but if you can spread them out over the different planes, that's when you're going to get the optimal results. So now that we've got the first point in the top left, what we can do is let's grab maybe this outside bottom right point. I click on it and it gets selected. You can see I get a new yellow crosshair on the projector. And I'll click and drag it where it needs to go. Now, we basically just rinse and repeat this process until we have about five or six points. So let's grab another point. Let's grab maybe this bottom left inner pillar point. And again, when you select that point, you get the yellow crosshair. And you just got to bring it to where it is in real life. Let's grab maybe this outside top right corner. Now one thing you'll notice is that we're quickly going to get into a situation where because our geometry is so simple we're going to get points unfortunately that are pretty close to each other which is not ideal for Cam Schnapper but there's not much that we can do with our geometry. We'll just keep going until it solves. So let's put our next point uh, how about here Similarly, I grab the yellow crosshair and start bringing it into position. And what you might start noticing is now that we're kind of approaching five or six points, you'll see flashes of light, crazy things happening, broken geometry. That's Cam Schnapper realizing that it's now starting to get enough data that it's able to solve for your projector position. And that's an important thing to note because really at the end of the day, Cam Schnapper is using the correlation between the points we're telling it are on the model and where they're ending up in real life and then it's saying okay well if, if this point is here and this corner is here then my projector must be somewhere around here and have you know kind of these characteristics and that's how it, it then pushes that camera matrix to the camera component which we can use in our render setup to make more or less a, a 3d approximation of our real world model so as I put that fourth point, well point four, which is point five, uh, it's almost there, but I might want to put one more point and maybe what I'll do is I will put it uh, maybe 
over here somewhere. Okay, great. So now when you get to this point, depending on the complexity of your geometry, you may want to throw down a few more points, go grab a couple more planes, but ours is pretty simple. So even these six points that we've thrown down are, are more than enough to have kind of put our geometry in place. What you can do to test really quickly is we can put that color map parameter back in. So we know it's cube underscore three slash diffuse map. And what you'll see is, is our model is now textured correctly using, you know, the texture that we created in Photoshop. Now it might not be perfect, and, and this is where we'll come eventually to using Vert Pusher, because, you know, in the real world all of our projectors may not be extremely good quality, they may be low resolution, you know, our model may not be exactly as, as we, you know, have our model in 3D, maybe the build is a little weird and something came out janky and then the measurements aren't correct. So if we get it pretty close in Camp Snapper, you know, I might adjust one or two points just to see if I can, let me adjust this point zero really quickly. Let me adjust this point four again. You wanna try and get it pretty close Like that is quite close that we have now. And then what you can do is, is we'll go into Vert Pusher and we'll basically isolate single points and then nudge them a little bit left or up or down just to kind of finesse any of the corners that may not be, uh, you know, complying as, as well as they should. So what we can do now is we can close this edit window and I will get rid of this color map again. Great, so now what we need is a window comp. We'll make that here. I'll attach a null after my render. And I'll set that as the operator of the window and configure the monitor to one. Turn off DPI scaling. And I'll set a custom 1280 by 720 for the projector. Turn off borders. Turn on always on top. Then I can open that in a separate window. And then what I'll do is I'll actually switch the material we have in here just so that we can avoid playing with lights. I'll set up a constant map. I'll set the color map as the diffuse map null. And then I'll set the render parameter to be constant one. And now you can see we have our own window going to the projector. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close and we can begin integrating Vert Pusher. Now the way we're gonna integrate Vert Pusher is that Camp Snapper is looking at our geometry. It's using that correlation between the geometry that we have and the real world to create a camera for us. Now we are rendering that same geometry but what we could do instead is use Vert Pusher in between our geometry here and our render. And then what we can do is actually edit a few points and render that instead of what Cam Snapper is looking at, which is our original geometry. So it's a little bit confusing, but you'll see once it's kind of made, it's a, it's a bit easier. So now we're ready to start working with Vert Pusher. So we can grab Vert Pusher from the forum, do a quick search for Vert Pusher, and it was made by a lovely gentleman named Dev Harlan. On the bottom of the first page is the latest download, so we'll click that and download it. Now I already have a copy ready here in my folder, and when you unzip that RAR file you'll have control underscore Vert Pusher underscore base point six point three point toe. So we'll open that up. We can ignore the warnings. 
and essentially we want everything that's in this network here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up a level, grab all of the Project One container, copy it, and I'll paste it in my project. Now if we open the viewer of Vert Pusher, we'll see that it has a couple of options that we need to set up first. So it wants to know where our camera comp is. So what we'll say is we can drag and drop cam snapper. And then it wants to know where my geometry stop is. So I will go into cube three, grab my mesh, and drag it onto the geometry stop. And I'll set my window to one. Now there's a few quick things we have to do with Vert Pusher to work in our setup. Like I said before, now Vert Pusher is seeing our original geometry, but we actually want to render the output of Vert Pusher. So we're going to go inside, and you'll find GeoMap Setup 5, and it has a SOP output. And if we put a null on it, we'll see that it's our geometry. I'll actually put an out SOP after that. That way it's easier to access on our root level. I'll put another null here so we can see it. And then we're going to want to put this into a geometry comp so that we can render this version instead of the original version. So I'll make a geometry comp. I'll go inside, delete the torus, set up an in sop. Make sure to turn on the render and display flags. Then I'll connect it. What I'm going to do is go to my render, and instead of looking at this cube 3 geometry, I'll look at this new geo 1. And the only thing we're missing is the material, so we can go into our cube 3, copy the material, and put it inside of geo 1. And then on the render page, we'll say the materials dot slash constant one. And now essentially we're back where we started with, you know, our progress after Camp Schnapper had solved for a camera. So if we open this window, we're going to get the same output that we had before. But now we have the ability with Vert Pusher to make some minute adjustments to the points. So what I'll do is actually I'll set this monitor back to zero. And we'll see all these little points on our geometry as well as in texture. And what we can do is we can go in and grab specific points. It's a little bit hard to see at this resolution, but we can grab points and then use the WASD keys to alter them. And what you'll see is as we're altering these G, um, individual points, in real time coming out of our window comp, we'll see these adjustments being made. So let's grab maybe this outside point here, adjust it a little bit. This bottom point could use a little bit of fine tuning. Let's grab this point. And from here, you could basically go through and adjust as many points as you needed to really finesse the final little touches of your geometry.